Haven, I think I think we should go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. I just hang on. Let me get my agenda. And I can put that up, Elisa, on the screen if you'd like, or if you want to keep yeah, us all. Thanks, I'll put that up for a few minutes. Okay. Alyssa, Aly Alyssa, if I can, if I can do my farewell right now, you know, at the beginning before you guys start business, then then I'll go ahead and uh, sign off. I just want to thank everybody. I've been on since the inception, and it has been very gratifying. I'm going to miss it, but I know I'm leaving it in great hands. So you guys keep up the good work and keep everything going. Dayton, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> at leader lpp so uh but thank you everybody for, and thank you all for the hard work you're doing so it's been great take we care had, guys we had scheduled to say thank you for all your service cj that was a little bit later in the in the meeting but we are so thankful for your guidance for being on the original i remember serving with you on city council and it's been an honor all right thank, thanks thank you cj bye I Okay, so we've established a quorum. So we need um for the agenda. I don't know why. I, I, I move noticed. that the agenda be accepted as written. Okay. Anyone second that? I second that. Okay, and the minutes as approved from last month or to approve from last month. I move to accept the minutes. Thank you, Dave. I second. Paula seconded it. Thanks, Paula. Do we have any public comments for today? I know we have presenters. I um Melissa, do you want to have the presenters on first and then we can do our other business just in case they have other things to do? So a couple of things right now. Um, so no public comments. So that's uh, true. I am double checking to make sure that as people come in, I have to actually admit people um, okay. because we have kind of gone into that mode now. And this is the first meeting that I've attended where I'm having to keep track of people wanting to come on. So bear with me as I look at that. Yeah, um, our, our one presenter for today is um, on the Tri-County Multimodal Study for Transportation. And she's gonna come in at some point in time because okay. she is in and out of meetings. And so right now she's not on, I don't see her um, coming on. And so then that said, really the first item that we, we really should do is make sure that we elect our chair and vice chair for 2022. So if that's okay, and I'm gonna Melissa, run through I, that. Yeah, I'm gonna let you put that forward yep. because okay. what we discussed. Yep, yep, so I'm gonna take a few minutes and um, share that with everybody. Um, and so, it is that time of year. Normally we would do this actually at the last meeting, but we ended up getting wind blown out. <laughs> so welcome back. And so the executive committee, which included the membership committee with Connie at the time, had conversations about who should be chair and vice chair. And um, again, we're gonna make a rec I'm gonna make a recommendation here now for that because we really don't have an actual membership chair at this point. Um, so I'm gonna go forward with that. And uh, that being said, there can be nominations from the floor. So if anyone you know, does want to be chair or vice chair, you are welcome to throw your hat in the ring if you want. Um, but that being said, I'm going to go ahead and mention that the folks that were recommended for chair, the person, is Elisa. She uh, stepped in last year and finished out the term um, and then has volunteered and said she would be willing to do it for another year. Uh, so she is stepping in to say she would do chair again. And then as vice chair, Mayling Rodriguez has said she would be interested in the vice chair role. That vice chair role is super important because ideally we want somebody to be vice chair for a year and then they would move into vice to chair for the second year. So it's really important that 
that person wants to have that continuity and Mei Ling is interested in doing that. So um, what I'm gonna propose right now um, is the chair um, as Elisa and vice chair is Mei Ling. And right now, if anybody has any comments from the floor or would like to um, recommend anybody else, I'm gonna take a moment and let people comment about that. Otherwise, I'll be looking for um, a nomination from the floor or a uh, motion from the floor to approve them. All right, so Dave, <clears throat> comment. Dave here. I, <clears throat> I'd be willing to be vice chair. Uh, Alyssa and I had a conversation on that. I'm not really, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's fine. I guess the, the really important thing from my perspective is that I'd have a voice where I can influence, if you will, and help shape where the organization is going. It doesn't have to be elected position like that. Just as a member of the commission, it'd be great. Oh, my God. So I just mentioned that, okay, just for what it's worth. I'd like to make a motion to accept Elisa as chair and Mei Ling as vice chair to the commission. I'll second that. And so go ahead, um, all in favor of going forward with that. Aye. Aye. All right, super. So we have gone ahead and set our executive leadership for the next year. Thank you, Dave, for offering your insight and interest too. You will be busy, even though you will not necessarily be vice chair, you will still be quite busy. Um, and so with that, at the next meeting, uh, Elisa as the chair will be looking to appoint committee chair people, the committee of the, or the chairperson for membership, as well as the chairperson for the advocacy committee. So stay tuned for that. There'll be conversations and talking. And at the meeting in February, we will be standing up the chairs for those two committees. So thanks, Elisa and Mei Ling, um, Dave, for offering your hat in the ring too. Um, but we are good to go. And I'm going to pop the agenda back up and let Elisa take over for a few more minutes. Um, mm. And then I'll let you know when our speaker gets on the line. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Melissa. Where is it? Okay, so our next week is our information items. And for right now, I kind of in the last month headed up the membership committee. And I'm happy to report that I have personally reached out, spoken to both one in person and one via telephone to new commissioners. So let me explain the thinking that we discussed in the executive meeting. Last year, we were seeking to fill areas that were underrepresented, meaning the teller, park, that whole path up there. We needed strong people up there to tell us what was going on in those areas. And they are very different than what we're representing in El Paso County. So we accomplished that last year. That was one of our accomplishments from last year, filling those, those spaces and these commissioners being active in their roles and having a lot of input. This year, we wanted to come at it a little differently. Um, there's, we want to be more known as the experts and move the initiatives that we are really passionate about along and hence the top three. That's why we decided to go that direction. So we can actually see some movement about what we're getting involved with. And, and know how that's coming along. So in that vein, we had identified the top three. And so we thought, let's reach out to some of our industry experts, if you will, that are in these roles and know, know the minutia of these areas. We reached out to Dayton Romero over at Silver Key, as uh, some of you have worked with him in the past and known him. Um, he was recently named as one of the emerging leaders from the mayor's office. He is involved in innovations in aging, all kinds of stuff, elder abuse. And so we think he brings a really great skill set. He's very analytical 
And um, when I had a conversation with him, he brought some really good ideas about structure, which Dave and I have talked about quite a bit of structuring, where are we going, how to measure that. The other, um, and we have received Dayton's membership packet. He has talked to us. Um, I believe we'll vote on that next month. We have also approached um, the person who is leading the senior center. Her name is Lindsay Pouncey. Um, I do know Lindsay from another life. Her and I worked in senior housing together. Um, she brings a different skill set. Uh, we talked about social isolation, social participation. She is well versed in housing and just brings, I think, these new commissioners. Um, will work really great together because a lot of their issues overlap like with us and we're all in the know. Um, the next thing is we reached out to Envita Transportation because that is a high priority for all of us as well in all of those counties. Um, Gail from Envita reached back out to me and told me she was traveling but we will have a conversation this week and she's gonna present it to her team um, if somebody would like to step forward and take a commissionership. Uh, so that'll be three new commissioners and they will be in uh, line with our goals. I'm also going to reach out to Eric Gibbs at Peak View um, as behavioral health is really high on our list. Um, and when I've talked to these interested commissioners, they are really gung ho. They are really knowledgeable. They have resources that we can tap into and they can bring to us from the other boards and committees. And a lot of them are involved in advocacy already. So I'm really excited to report that's where we're at with the commissioners. Um, does anybody have any comments? I know a lot of you might know Dayton and Lindsay and Gail um, Niels over at Invita. Some thoughts, feedback, everyone. This is Dave. I know uh, I, I know Jason. I know the, his for, the previous executive director quite well. She lives up in the Tri Lakes area, and I also know uh, Gail from Invita since I drive for Invita up in the Tri Lakes area. So I think that's a great strategy that you've got to get those people. I don't know Lindsay, but I know about the senior center, and that's where Jody came from. So there's a real good tie there as well. So I think that's that's a real good approach that you've laid out for 2022. I will add um, a big hello to my colleague, um, Dayton. I'm super excited to have him um, to add his knowledge. I think that us being a united front, um, specifically with DEI issues, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think that he brings a really great perspective, especially with the concept of adding measurable um, ways of analysis is really important. So I think that's also a great level of expertise and um, being lockstep in that is perfect. And I will also endorse Gail. Um, she's been there for a long time, has been a part of the senior community, knows the inside outs of all the issues. So um, I'm glad to see that she's being considered. She's a wealth of information. If no, none of you have met Gail, She's a powerhouse and a wealth of information and just very well respected. And I look forward to who she puts forth from her team and who would like, would be interested. They are gonna give us some really great um, ideas on transportation and especially in rural areas. And I'm, I'm eager to hear that. That is where we are in membership. So, so Lisa, yes. I can interrupt for one second. It looks like yeah, Laura. Laura is coming on for the Tri-County uh, study. So if, since we're kind of finished with that membership committee uh, piece, maybe we have her jump on before we jump into policy or we could continue with- Yeah, policy. great. No, we wanna respect her time, so that's great. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stop the screen sharing. Um, and then uh, Laura Cruz, um, who is our mobility coordinator here with the Pikes Peak Area Agency on Aging is going to share a little bit about um, the multimodal tri-county study underway. Welcome, Laura. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me today. And sorry, I was late getting on the call, um, managing many hats right now. So um, is anybody on the call familiar with the tri-county study that the PPACG is doing? Okay, great. 
Um, the Tri-County study is the first study of its kind in this area, um, to our knowledge. Um, CDOT approached us over a year ago to really talk about how can we start from a planning perspective, from a regional planning perspective. Um, they do regional transit plans and transportation plans in the rural areas, but have not necessarily roped in um, what's called the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Areas, with a rural area to do a study. So it's always been a metropolitan area has transportation and transit planning studies, and the rural areas have a separate transit planning study. So this is a mesh of that. So um, as um, Melissa mentioned, it is a multimodal study, so it is partially funded through um, what's called MMOF funds, so multi multimodal option funds that come through um, Senate Bill 260. Um, this year, it's kind of uh, multimodal funds are going to be a little bit of a mix of state funds and federal funds, but for this um, study, it's state funding. So we're looking at tra transportation and transit challenges, um, as well as infrastructure challenges across um, Teller Park and El Paso counties. Um, not singling out one county in particular, really looking at regional um, connections between the communities and what are some of the barriers in order to provide services um, but also provide economic growth opportun opportunities. And so um, I am helping assist with that. I'm not the lead team member on, on that project. It's Jason O'Brien. He is um, one of our planners in our transportation department, but I am leading the um, transit focus group team. So um, we, we had stakeholder meetings in each one of the counties that included a lot of municipal staff, um, municipal staff that were um, surrounded around utilities, public health, um, even you know, bike pedestrian um, folks, um, those that are working on trail systems that cross boundaries, um, and even our military installations were involved in those initial stakeholder meetings. Um, we also had some of our agencies, our AAA agencies that per have participated in the stakeholder meetings and are kind of acting as some of our champions and specifically our rural areas. So from those initial stakeholder meetings, um, we identified three main, let's see, three main um, uh, focus groups that we wanted to kind of drill down and focus talk about that we wanted to drill down on. Um, one of those is uh, transit. Um, that was a common theme throughout the conversations with um, stakeholders that transit um, is a major need and a, a huge need for our rural um, residents to be able to get to doctor's appointments, jobs, those types of things, transit is, is such a challenge. Um, and then we're calling it sort of a um, innovative mobility group. Um, it sounds like trans transit, but it's not. It's really talking about things that um, help people be mobile in a lot of different ways um, from a technological standpoint. So things like broadband, um, are in discussions um, with that focus group. And then the third focus group that um, we have is the emergency management um, focus group. Actually, there's four, I just remember the other one. Um, uh, emergency management focus group. And those um, emergency managers across those three county regions are talking about, as you guys know, wildfire mitigation, those types of things. Um, that um, kind of cross boundaries um, and even involving, you know, the Forest Service, which is its own entity um, within these areas to talk about some of those um, challenges um, in emergency preparedness. And then last week, lastly, we have a focus group on um, trails systems. So um, because there's a multimodal um, uh, emphasis in this study, um, 
there's an emphasis on, you know, all modes of transportation. And so we saw there um, was an overarching kind of theme of need for collaboration amongst um, some of our trail um, agencies, trail building agencies and different planners from different um, of our uh, counties that are working on trail systems and thinking about trail systems from a regional perspective, um, which is also an a economic generator for our region. So, um, so from the transit focus group side, um, I have split us up. Um, I have two transit groups, um, just because I like to make it a little bit interesting, um, but also want to provide a platform for everybody to feel comfortable and talk about, you know, their needs, their challenges, um, and opportunities that they see for um, enhancement and growth in our region. So our first meeting is going to be with um, our advocate group. So those are um, individuals that have been identified as um, people who represent those that depend upon transit. Um, and also some people who utilize transit themselves and are end users. And you can see my cat in the back. She has been bombing every meeting today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but so that first group, we're going to just have open conversations with them about what they, they experience and what their clients experience in, in transportation, um, with transportation in our region. And then we're going to take that information and bring it to the provider focus group. Um, I have elected to have a, um, a ambassador from the advocate group to um, help report out to the provider group and so that the provider group can really hear what are the the underlying themes of, of issues and challenges from a regional perspective um, with transit and the provider group can hear those and start working towards um, collaborative solutions and projects that they may um, think that they may put together that would be very beneficial to help overcome some of these challenges. So um, that's sort of the gist of, of what we're doing and where we are with that study. Um, the end goal is to um, uh, come up with a list of projects as well as policy opportunities and just functional opportunities um, to make great changes in our area. So from a policy perspective, are we seeing, you know, different policies that are inhibiting, you know, transit or inhibiting transportation um, from in terms of road projects and those types of things? Um, are there some some barriers there that are keeping us from doing the best work that we can? And so one of the transit um, policy things that um, Melissa cued me to kind of talk to you guys about because you guys are kind of putting together some of your policy, um, uh, putting together your policy work that you want to work on this year. So I want to bring to y'all's attention um, a, a headache problem for transit providers. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys know, but those that provide what's called demand response transportation. So that's paratransit, that's um, um, Medicaid rides, that is specialized transportation, so door three door services. Um, they, get, they do not get paid for the mileage in the services to actually go and pick up an individual. Their payment and reimbursement only starts when they pick up that individual and start take, starts taking them somewhere. So we call that deadhead miles. So it's one of the big inhibitors of providing transportation um, in general, but more specifically in rural areas, because you may be driving 30 miles to go pick up an individual, but you don't get paid for that 30 miles that you drove to, to pick up that individual. You only get paid for when they end up when they're in your car. And so um, that's a huge challenge as we're trying to develop more transit opportunities for rural areas and for areas that really need a demand response type of transportation. 
And so some of the solutions that are out there that um, to as kind of a workaround to so that is, okay, let's start a transit agency and say, for instance, Park County, um, because that, you know, minimizes the deadhead miles. But it's also one of those challenges that if you do start a transit agency, do you have enough demand to really support that transit agency um, um, and for it to be worthwhile for that community or whoever's managing that transit system? So that's one of the things that from a policy perspective, deadhead miles is really challenging to um, agencies that are trying to reach out um, beyond uh, the urbanized areas to be able to provide um, services um, because it's just, it's not financially feasible for most agencies to be able to do that. And if they do, they have to provide, find supplemental funding through um, some source that doesn't really have a deadhead mile um, type of uh, requirement behind it. So deadhead miles applies to AAA funding, which we administer. Deadhead miles re, um, applies to any kind of federal tra transit funding, even um, Medicaid, NEMT rides. Um, that, those are the same challenges with every one of those programs that are federally um, or state funded um, is that there's, there is that deadhead mile situation. So um, I know it's not really um, uh, what I like to say, kind of a sexy cause <laughs> uh, to talk about deadhead miles, but it, it's what is kind of inhibiting this, this transformation of of being able to provide services um, more equitably across our service area um, and just the lack of reimbursement for the actual cost of providing transportation is just challenging. Question. Um, yeah. Have you explored um, the usage of carpool um, alternatives in rural areas? I know that there's a little bit of research on the value of it. Have you um, explored that at all? Yeah, so we actually have, um, Park County Senior Coalition is doing a volunteer driver program um, and also providing, it's a volunteer driver program. So they have volunteers that are helping drive just their neighbors. Um, and we're helping, AAA is actually helping reimburse um, those rides um, to those individuals that are, are giving those rides to individuals. So we do have those types of programs going on. Um, I know from an urban perspective, um, Mountain Metro Transit actually operates a van pool program, a carpool, pro a school pool, school pool program, and they have a social media matching system for carpool. Um, and so there are a lot of resources out there. However, we're finding just the general knowledge of the public about those resources is very minimal. So there's opportunities there to expand that. Um, there's also some opportunity for us to further explore, you know, a more sophisticated volunteer driver program. Um, it comes with its own challenges in terms of insurance and um, ensuring that the, the drivers have um, a safe driving record, those types of things. If we're operating more on a voucher system like we are right now in Park County where they're reimbursing a neighbor who's helping somebody give, a, give them a ride to uh, a doctor appointment mm -hmm. or those types of things, then there's less liability there. Um, but if we had a more formalized system to that extent, we would have to kind of explore what that would look like from a financial and, and a management side of implementing a program like that. So Laura, I was thinking something along the same lines as Mei Ling, like, would it be feasible and less money, say whatever your transportation provider is, say they would it be cheaper to buy like two vans, place one at a satellite location in Teller County that services Teller and Cripple Creek and one in Park County? And that 
uh, provider has a full-time employee that lives in that area. We already do that. We already, already have, yeah, <laughs> we already do that. Our pro providers are doing things like that um, already. But what has have, had to occur is to have enough customers to really justify it. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets difficult in more of these remote areas, um, specifically like Park County. Um, Teller County, you know, we have you know, much more population and the population is more condensed, whereas in Park County, it's very spread out. And to justify a van that may go out once a day to pick up somebody and pay a full-time employee is something that is very difficult for one of our agency, agencies to sustain. So right now it's either piggybacking on to a ride with um, uh, a, a different ride within Teller County or those types of situations. But both Invita, Invita actually just hired a staff member from um, Woodland Park, and that's the main driver that's going to be driving Invita's vehicle up there. Um, and they stage a vehicle up there. So those types of things are already happening, but we still have to have the ridership justification to make those investments. And actually, Park, Park County Senior Coalition used to have their own um, transit. They had, a, I think, a couple of vans, um, and Gretchen probably knows more about this than I do, but they had a couple of vans, and they were doing transit services through a volunteer program um, in the past, and it, it wasn't financially feasible for them to continue that program. That's yeah, having done some transportation where the Mountain Community Senior Services had a transit van, I believe, now that they are working or that's been rolled up into Invita. Again, it's because of that demand. The, a, a different thought would be in that looking for volunteer drivers or looking to match the drivers with the demand. And has there been exploratory discussions with churches, especially in the rural areas? The churches have volunteer uh, drivers to take care of parishioners, that type of thing if there was some way to link the Catholic Church with the Baptist Church with the Lutheran Church, there may be a, a, a body of volunteers that are available that just aren't known to the transit community. Yeah, I think that's a great um, suggestion. I, I come from food banking, which is heavily working with churches. 90% of our agencies were churches. Um, and I think that there's definitely opportunities there to, to further engage them in doing outreach in that way. Um, you know, I, 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 I think our challenge that we have is just our bandwidth to coordinate um, at that level. Um, it is definitely an opportunity to, to explore, but it's, it's hard to, to figure out our bandwidth to coordinate at that granular, granular level um, of transportation, especially for, um, we need consistent transportation. I think that's just the overarching challenge is, is the consistent transportation. Um, because these folks that really need it in these rural areas are folks that are going to regular doctor's appointments and they're going far. <laughs> um, so your Park County folks are going up into Summit County or going into Fremont County or going to Denver. Right. Um, it's not a short trip. So um, that's where it's really the system that's supposed to be providing transportation for these folks um, needs to be enhanced. And that's where I think when we're talking about a policy standpoint, that deadhead mile piece, that's a kicker, that's, that's a killer. Um, that's exactly where I'm going with this, uh, uh, Laura, as I'm thinking the same thing. This is actually a policy issue and this is where we can be advocates to try to get that policy changed. I'm sure that's probably a federal government guideline that we have to follow. It but is. Does a, state, does a state have any kind of ability to maneuver around that? Do they have other fundings available that we could possibly tap into to help that? Um, I mean, we obviously could, you know, take a stab at trying to change federal legislation on that. Um, 
but seriously, it's more of an advocacy and a policy issue right, that we, right. if we're saying that we're we're going to support transportation this year, I think that's kind of that's the kind of activity we need to do. Yeah, yeah, and and we we every transit conference you go to, there, there's the two two words: deadhead miles and then first mile, first mile, last mile challenges. So you may have a fixed route or traditional bus system um, going through a community, but how do you get people to the bus stop? Uh, and, and those that can't get to the bus stop are usually the ones that are dependent upon specialized transportation, which is the most expensive transportation out there. And so how do we overcome some of these first mile, last mile issues of, of being able to make transfers of people um, to get them to the places that they need to go? I'll give you an, a scenario that I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> and I don't know if Jody's on the call, but I don't see his face. Um, but, um, you know, from, from a, a, a technical standpoint, um, it's really hard for us on a mechanical way to um, work a transfer with a person, an individual. So say, for instance, somebody from Teller County has an appointment down in El Paso County and Invita is willing to pick up um, that person from Teller Senior Coalition's. Um, if Teller Senior Coalition brought somebody to Manitou, okay, and then Invita came to pick up that individual and take them into town to, to do their appointment. Right now, we don't have the mechanisms to be able to pay for that ride because it's two agencies providing the ride to the same person. So there's administrative opportunities that we can go ahead and start working on. And, and that's something that Jody and I met about today is how do we overcome some of those administrative challenges just in how the programs are implemented at the state level. So there's that piece of it, um, but also you know this larger challenge that we have um, that the state could be um, recognizing and saying, okay, yes, this is a federal mandate, but from a state perspective, we're going to pay for that. You know, we're going to pay for rural transportation or supplement rural transportation to help um, cover the cost that federal dollars doesn't cover. So there's, there's definitely some opportunities for the state to step in and help with that. Do we have anybody, does anybody know of uh, any legislators that are dealing with transportation issues that we can, yeah, of course, Laura would know. Is there a way you can get us a list, uh, Laura, of all the legislators who are working on transportation issues and we can jump on a letter and just say, you know, this is what needs to happen? Yeah, so we actually had a group that came down a couple of months ago um, and Senator Winters is, She's not a representative of ours, I don't believe. I'm new to the area still. <laughs> um, but she has definitely been cha um, championing a lot of ideas around um, specifically NEMT because NEMT um, has the same challenges as FTA and, and the other uh, AAA programs and those types of things. But um, she's looking at it from the perspective of NEMT rides and so this is the same conversation that we've been having with her is like deadhead miles is, is what's killing us. And also the fact that these programs don't allow um, others to broker rides with each other and not necessarily broker rides with each other, but just share rides with each other. So um, those of you who may not know, um, Intelleride used to be the um, one call for NEMT rides for Colorado. That started last year, it went kaput um, in August. And so it went back to where individual clients have to call the individual transit provider to schedule their rides. So the reason why it went kaput is there's all these nuances about these transit agencies that from operational perspective, you're never going to be able to manage that from a statewide perspective because not everybody's open nine to five Monday through Friday. It just doesn't happen that way. And so they they could not manage it from that level. But we're trying to advocate from just a regional level, more of a local level, 
How can our providers be working with each other to share rides um, in a more formal setting? So say for instance, if we have a provider that is, a, is um, an NEMT hub, what I would call an NEMT hub, and people call into, um, say for instance, Invita, who's an NEMT provider, and Invita is already networked with Silver Key and Fountain Valley. The Silver Key and Fountain Valley aren't any EMT providers. Right now, Invita doesn't have the ability to subcontract with either one of those providers to provide any EMT rides. So that's one of the administrative things is if there was an any EMT provider, if they had the abilities to subcontract with other agencies to provide rides, um, when they were at capacity of providing a ride or when there's a better ride that could be available for that individual. So, um, you know, you may say, well, why doesn't Silver Key, why doesn't Fountain Valley become an EMT provider? It is, takes a lot <laughs> to, to be able to process Medicaid. And so um, if you want to open the spectrum of availability of transit providers from an EMT perspective, then having the ability to have localized brokerage is going to be super helpful. So those are two things, deadhead miles and this brokerage idea is what we have presented to Senator Winters. And so I, I will get that list um, from Andy of those that participated in um, the visits. They actually came to um, Mountain Metro Transit and talked to us specifically about the NEMT program. So I'll get, I'll get you their um, contact information. I know Andy Pico was one of them um, that came. Um, uh, I'll have, I'll get the list, so. And is there so, anything else you think the, the Commission on Aging can help you with to try to solve this problem? Do you see value in um, our coalition? Do you think that there's something we can actually, uh, and we can write letters, I know that much, but if you need us to, show up or something like that, you know, let us know. Yeah, we will do. Um, I think that would be super helpful just to continue to hit home those um, specific points. And I'll even send you guys um, the specific points that Andy and I sent to Senator Winters so that you can kind of see the talking points that are coming out of the PACG. Um, so I can get that to Melissa and, and get that on to you guys. Um, you know, we, we have these challenges. We all have these challenges with match requirements of programs, <laughs> but, but specifically tied to transit, those are the two biggest challenges that we have. It's just the lack of being able to be flexible um, and, and to administratively um, address these issues. That's that's great. That's why we have you on, Laura, to give us. Uh, you're the you're the expert in this, and we're still learning. So, um, but we want to be a, a formidable force to be able to make this um, change because we think it's important. We've uh, agreed that's important. So, thank you. Right. So Paula has her hand up, and I know she's been wanting to say something. So I'm just okay. going to jump in and let her speak up. <laughs> hey, hi, Paula. Hi. Um, the brokerage of rides has been discussed, I know, between myself and Envita because we uh, are transferring, transporting a lot uh, of El Paso County, and we've had even Park County people come into our day program. And so to be able to have help with getting people across uh, El Paso County, even just at the bottom of the hill, so that all of our participants aren't spending two hours on the bus just to get to our program trying to pick up everyone is it would be a huge help um, to just have it be to pick out pick up the outline people and we have a lady coming from Voyager Parkway now um, just to to get her and meet us at the bottom of the hill so it would be a half hour ride to, to daybreak for them and they can get everything out of the program so in Vita and and I are already in discussion about how, how can we make that happen. Um, the senior transport is, is a beast in and of itself. The senior driver needs to be really trained well. It's not just a driver job, it's a, it's a trained job. And I just hired a driver because we just got a vehicle from CDOT and I just put out 
emails to volunteers to see if I can't have that driver be by himself or herself in that vehicle with my clients. Right. I can't have that driver go to the door to pick up a, a client with clients in the in the van by by themselves. I have to have a two person pickup, and and often. Um, you know, it's go in the house and have a conversation and, and lure them into the vehicle while someone has to be on the bus with the other people. So I've had um, TSC leave one of my people on my doorstep when we weren't open yet um, because they are door to door. They're not, you know, seat to chair into the living room. That's terrifying to me. So I think, you know, it's one thing to, to collaborate with this transportation, but the drivers have to be trained. And if they're transporting dementia or really heavy need people, it's, yeah. it's, a, two, it's a two person thing. And I'm hoping I can find volunteers that will want a morning, want to help with the morning pickup and an afternoon drop off because that driver isn't able to do that by themselves, so. Yeah, it's it, it, staffing has been really a challenge and it just continues to be more and more of a challenge. Yeah. Um, and the ability to pay for two drivers on a, a van and, and have a, a seat that, that's not filled. And I have by a customer that's um, you can get reimbursement for, I think is challenging. You know, Paula, you bring up a good point. You know, when I'm talking to you, our transit providers, even, you know, Mount Metro, one of the biggest challenges right now is, is um, helping out with the day programs <laughs> and, and is trying to like figure out how can they manage day programs with their limited uh, resources in terms of staffing right now, um, as well as, you know, just um, in terms of types of reimbursement for those types of rides. Uh, to give you an idea, our FTA 5310 rides for um, specialized transportation can't be used for in enro closed enrolled programs. So it's a public transportation funding. And so it's these weird nuances within these programs that um, kind of narrow down what we can utilize in terms of funding for specific programs that are great. I have a program that I'm, I'm not entirely for sure how I can fund uh, that is a workforce program that, that brings people to you that are um, individuals with disabilities that want to work but can't drive, brings them to work every day, and um, they, they're, you know, getting a wage. Um, and that's an amazing program, but we can't fund it with 5310. So it's just one of those frustrating things of from a federal side of the requirements around these specific programs um, that are great, but um, the requirement of being public transportation and being accessible to everyone actually kind of sometimes hinders who you can actually serve um, with those, those dollars, so. So Laura, I have a, a question. So going forward, I think that some of our commissioners could be really helpful to you. Like when you're talking about these different rural, Paula's up in Teller County, we have Amy Mitchell, who's not on the call and she's from Park County. And we also work, we send information, share information with Jenny Danner at Park mm -hmm. County and have a really good reciprocal information. So I think these, three women could be really great on your rural that have feedback. And then you said one of your committees is the emergency management. One of our commissioners, Dave Bessler, is very knowledgeable about fire mitigation and those kind of things. So is there a way for you to invite them to be a part of this if they have the time so they can help with the conversation? Yeah, so actually Jenny is um, on our, Jenny and Paula, Paula, you got an invite to the advocate meeting um, and Jenny is also going to be in the advocate transit focus group meeting as well. Um, so already engaging those, um, David, 
I don't know if they've engaged you on wildfire mitigation, but I can give your contact information because I have it um, to uh, Jason. Um, I'm not sure if they've started their focus group, group meetings, but if that's something you're interested in, we can get you engaged. Sure, you can go ahead and use me for that. Uh, I, had a, I had a suggestion too, is that I uh, just want to echo the comments. So thank you that uh, Connie and uh, Alyssa threw your way. Just thank you for your presentation. But I think the other piece would be that innovative mobility. It would be great to have somebody from that uh, that group or team to give us sort of a similar pitch that you've just given for uh, for the transit piece. That would be yeah. very, very helpful because I'm thinking that the innovative mobility would talk and, and raise a number of policy issues or recommendations as well. I was thinking telehealth and 5G connectivity, those types of things would come out that would that impacts the transit in the sense that if you it would minimize potentially the number of uh, runs you have to make or volunteers that are needed for medical appointments, if you could do reduce the number by telehealth. So especially in rural areas, I'm sure that's a, that's a major issue. Uh, similarly, on the emergency management, I think the key there that I would throw out, if they would, uh, if we could also get a presentation from that group, uh, I'm very familiar with the uh, the Tri Lakes area, and 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 especially the the actual fire districts, fire departments, if you will, their major responsibility when they have calls, if they have a hundred calls in a period of time, probably 75 or 80 percent are medical, mm -hmm. and of that medical, probably 60 to 70 percent are seniors. So there's, there's a real uh, amount of transportation and assistance that's given in that area as well. And, and again, it would just be helpful, I think, for the commission to understand how big and broad uh, the issue is for these other subgroups that you're talking about. But again, thank you. Well, what I think is great if these people, if our commissioners are already on these committees, that's always something that we can ask you to report out on inside our meeting, like, Paula and Amy Mitchell and those folks. And if Dave attends that, that's somewhere that we could also get the information from what you're doing, Laura, filtered back into just put, you know, back into our meetings from them. Yeah. And, and in particular, I just want to clarify that the focus group meetings is literally going to be one to two meetings per, per subject. Um, so Dave, I'll try to, I don't know if they've already had their meetings um, yet, but I'll try to get you plugged in for sure. But I wanna let you know that, that Dave brought up a good point. Um, in a sense, there's crossover between these um, different groups. And that's something that Jason and I actually met on last week is how do we um, sort of regroup with the larger group and say, okay, here are, crossover themes that we feel are, are items that need to be worked on beyond the study. Um, you, you made a great point. It also came up today in my regional coordinating meeting up in Cripple Creek, um, where a driver actually got lost um, in a dead zone. <laughs> and um, and his, his wife called, was very upset about it. You know, luckily the vehicles that, that most of these transit providers have have GPS on them and they're being tracked and can be tracked, you know, more on a sort of type of offline sort of scenario. Um, so they knew where the driver was, but they didn't know how to communicate with them. And so that was one of the conversations that we talked about today is how do we enhance that system? Um, I will say that one thing in particular in terms of communication that was talked about in the Park County meeting was we hear all this talk about broadband, but really from like a operational perspective from emergency management, as well as um, transit and just general consumer, um, cell phone service <laughs> is something that is cheaper and quicker to stand up than um, running lines out places. So we need to kind of braid in that conversation with broadband, the, the need for cell phone coverage in these areas that, that currently don't have it. Um, because that can serve as a purpose for internet, internet and um, things like, you know, 
video calls with your doctor, those types of things can be utilized on good, um, good cell phone service. So we, we are folding that conversation in as well as, okay, we, we have all this money going towards broadband and, and, and uh, momentum towards broadband, but also we need to continue at the table this conversation about cell phone um, service and reliability in these areas in particular. So, but yes, the idea is out of these focus groups is to hone in on individual projects that are specific to that focus group, but also um, put together a list of um, braided things that we need to be talking about regionally after the study is completed. So uh, thank you again for being here with us, Laura. Is there any way going forward, if you find like information that you know you've discussed with us, you could forward to us so we can all be like well-versed on what's going on, especially when maybe three or four of our commissioners are gonna be on your subcommittees. And so we can all know too what you're working on and where the needs are. Will do, will do. And so I'll, I'll use Melissa as the conduit for that information and send that on. Thank you again. This has been really informative. I think from all, talking for all of us, this has been really informative and it's things we need to know about, uh, especially since transportation is our number two uh, top three for this year. So we really appreciate you being here, Laura. Thanks for having me. All right, I think next is our policy. And Mei Ling, were you gonna talk about some of the things you and I attended um, since our last meeting? I was um, thinking that we would piggyback the um, SAPCA meeting. Um, and then I can also speak to some of the advocacy priorities, if that makes sense, Elise. Well, you know what I realized when we were all talking? we didn't formally talk about the letter i had sent out from the previous meeting all of i took all of the suggestions of the top three from all the commissioners that put forth and by far the number one was housing number two was transportation number three i thought we could co-mingle because it was social isolation social participation behavioral and mental health and i think uh those two but we we kind of need to formally vote on those because if we're going to build off that for the coming year we need to say we're all in agreement of how that goes and so elisa the idea was is that there were going to be discussion about that under discussion items but okay. they actually taken a formal vote on it at the february meeting so again okay. this kind of opportunity under discussion dave sharing about kind of the processes for looking at priorities then spending a little bit of time talking about the priorities and then voting would happen uh, in February. Okay, because I I don't know how, if we can talk about advocacy if we haven't voted in what we're doing or, or should we discuss it anyway? I think it's okay for Mei Ling just to give kind of that for you guys to talk a little bit about SAPCA and what you kind of learned and then she can share what the PPACG kind of focus is for the year um because then coa will kind of inter you know interconnect with that over time all right take it away mailing perfect so um like i said with sapca i think that um i appreciate if elisa um and i could piggyback off of this um it was a very broad and in-depth meeting um if that's okay elisa if you want to add your your take on it as well um, the biggest um, interesting point of context was the um, reevaluation of the Older American Act. And so why this is important is basically giving um, the amendments of the establishment of the Area Agency on Aging, Home Care, Almost Bond Persons, uh, Amendment to Disabilities, so reallocation of funding and also the changing of the amounts of persons that would be allowable in within that. Um, what we think what makes this important is it gives access to issues, Meals on Wheels, Area Agency on Aging, um, 
Elise, do you want to piggyback off of this? So a, a couple of notes I wrote down is they also had somebody on from the Bell Policy Center and um, Melissa's working on getting us a copy. It's called the State of Aging. And the key takeaways that they were talking about at a state level are what they found was that there's economic vulnerability in different groups. Um, that was number one. Number two was there's racial disparities for older Black, Indigenous, people of color in the state of Colorado. And the third one was that systems vary significantly by their geographical area, which makes sense to us as we discussed before. El Paso looks different than Teller, looks different than Park. Um, and they've all also are noting a rise in age discrimination in the workplace. And another note that I wrote down was that Colorado is ranked 51st in the nation for caring for mental health, which ties into one of our, our you know, third tier, which is just, I just think that's terrible for, you know, as innovative as we are in other areas for us to be 51st in the nation. And I'm trying to think of what else we... I think we were also talking about um, the idea of um, folks continuing to have gainful employment past the age of 65 and the differentiation between um, choosing to work and being exposed to a work situation that is not yes. equitable. Um, so someone maybe, especially in COVID, um, being put in a situation that might put them at a heightened risk and um, being in the heightened vulnerability because of that work situation and not being able to afford to retire and looking at opportunities for greater advocacy in that area as well. Mm -hmm. And then we also, on the PPACG Legislative Meeting Committee, um, there was a gentleman that I'm um, wanting to reach out to for further discussion with us. His name is Dan Jablin, and he's from Cherry Point Strategy, and he's the lobbyist for the PPACG and brings the issues and tells us what's going on. And so I would wanted to reach out to him as soon as we vote in our top three and tell him areas that we're focusing on. And then he could come on and tell us what kind of like you were asking uh, Laura Cruz about the transportation, what legislation is plausible to be passed in the areas that we're discussing. So we know from an advocacy standpoint, like where's our best uh, placement for traction to actually get something going, like what's already going up surrounding the areas that we want to advocate for. And then when he tells us that, can we like glean down from there where we really might have some traction for our three counties and how to go on. So his name is Dan Jablin and I am hoping to reach out to him and have him on for the March meeting once we vote and we know where these things are falling out. And then just to give a sense of the Colorado Center for Aging and some of the policy issues that they are um, seeing are very much in line with um, what we have been talking about is around adult protections, age discrimination, um, particularly around um, access to um, workplace discrimination, um, behavioral health, broadband, um, how that impacts caregiving, um, food and nutrition, um, mobile home parks, um, and then also the, the value of older adults. So there is um, quite a few bills of legislation that Colorado Center for Aging is tracking. And so once we decide the, the buckets and what makes sense for us um, getting a, a better pulse on that. Right, I, I, yes. Let me see. Um, okay, anything else, Mei Ling, that you wanted to bring up? Um, 
I think that that is a good overview for, for this meeting. I look forward to be more in depth in February. Okay, so I'm just gonna go into my chair report. I'm really excited to have everybody on board. If I could throw in one thing here, Alyssa, the- uh, Sure, go ahead, Dave. A thought would be that, uh, especially related to policy and priorities, there has been quite a bit of work that's been done by some by existing agencies. Uh, the strategic plan, both for the PPACG and for the Area Agency on Aging, and they go through, a, if I remember right, I think the AAA plan goes through four years, a three or four years time frame, and it lists the issues and lists the priorities and things that they're working on. Similarly, the strategic plans also is something that possibly we could take a look at so that when we come up with the uh, primary areas or the focus areas and we get briefings from others on what their priorities and how, are and how they see things, part of the responsibility probably resides with the commission, us as commissioners, to do some homework and pull stuff out of existing documents and then do a, a sort of a, a rational, a rational check on that to make sure that, okay, that we're covering what really needs to be done. It's just a suggestion at this point. No, so, I, I, I agree. And I'll comment on that a little further because um, as we've been working to get liaison representation from the RAC to the commission and the commission back to the RAC, Jen Nimmo is on as the RAC uh, liaison to the commission. And she actually chairs the technical review or the strategic review subcommittee with the RAC City review, City review. Um, that actually looks at the four year plan for the AAA and identifies the priorities for the RAC to be focused on as they look at new services and supports in the region. And so there's definitely good overlap happening there. Um, with Jen hearing the things that are going to be coming up at the Commission on Aging meetings, and she can be bringing those back to the RAC, and she could actually even speak at some point in time, maybe not today, um, specifically to the things that the RAC has decided to focus on um, okay. from a strategic uh, perspective. And again, with the Regional Advisory Council, it's really looking at services um, for people, and so it's not necessarily advocating and going out and doing what the commission is doing by any stretch. It is literally, do we have the service providers in our region to provide the transportation services, the food and nutrition services, the behavioral health services, and how do we get those services up and running? <laughs> so um, really nice uh, interplay going on today with all of that. And Dave tried to correct me and tried to tell me that it was called something else, but since Dave has left the rack, we actually have kind of changed the subject, changed the name of it. So Dave was the guy who started that committee, but now it's evolved into kind of having its own name, but it is alive and well. So anyway, there we go. Congratulations, Jen. <laughs> so thanks so much, Dave. Uh, we I appreciate it. out to Debbie and to Dave, and we, they are going to be the next commissioners that are featured on social media. And then Mei Ling and I are meeting on Monday and we're just trying to uh, simplify a lot of stuff going forward. We want to look at uh, a yearly, so we're going to break it down by month, what's going on um, and what we want to feature. So we kind of have a plan and we can strategically just maybe, you know, uh, pre-tape things for social media or just it's just simplify it so we can get it to Melissa and it's just, we don't have to think about it every month. We've already got this calendar that we're working on. So we'll be uh, meeting on Monday to talk about, you know, our social media calendar. Um, I already told you about reaching out to the lobbyist. Um, Nimble, who was supposed to be a presenter is gonna get us information packets. And as soon as I get all that, I'll just forward that to all of you. When I was on one of the meetings the other day, Debbie Swanson was on with me and she um, has some interest in and she is gonna be sitting on a, a committee um, for Drive Smart. Um, and she'll be bringing us that aspect back to our meetings. 
once she gets to be a part of that, I'm, I'm supposing, right, Debbie, that you can tell us what's going on in Drive Smart and accident and, and roadways that's going on um, with our senior community. Well, the, the, that's it's a board position, and so I would have to be voted in, and uh, okay, I'm assuming okay. that is exactly what would happen once I uh, get that process going. That's just another layer of transportation that we we would have more knowledge on, so that would be great as well. So thank you for doing that, Debbie. Um, I also heard, I don't know, at the PPACG board meeting, they were talking about some kind of call system for seniors, and the PPAC board asked that to be looked into for our region. Melissa, am I getting that right? What? Okay, it's some kind of call system. Is it like an emergency? So, yeah, so a couple of different opportunities there. So um, two of the PPACG board member commissioners mentioned the idea of expanding kind of the uh, calls of reassurance program out there so that um, for individuals who want to kind of have more kind of connection and, and be able to know that people know that they're okay, we have that out there. So like right now there's, there's physical calls that are made on a pretty regular basis to a variety of people, uh, primarily through Silver Key and um, some of the, um, and some of the agencies in Teller County but those are physical calls and connections. And so one of the things that they're looking at is kind of a robo call system where a person could get a phone call and then they just hit one, they're okay, or two, they need a call or need help. And Gretchen talked about kind of an expansion of, Gretchen uh, who's on the call today, talked about an expansion um, with, our, with the Lifeline program. So yeah, that's being kind of explored a little bit more. So I think that also ties in the reason I mentioned that, um, that I feel like that almost ties into, you know, socialization and participation. So people are being checked on. So that's the reason I mentioned that. Um, also at their meeting, they talked about CDOT's 10 year plan. Um, and I also saw somewhere that in this, this summer of 2022, the DMV, um, has funded a mobile office that is going to go to rural areas. So I think that's also good for us to know about um, to help like renew and do stuff that you would do through the DMV, only they're going to take it on the road. So we should be looking for that this summer. Um, we had reached out. Um, oh, Melissa, I just want to, why it's on my mind. Um, can you have Jessica Bechtel take off our old commissioner off the email list? Thank you. Yep. I was like, I have to say it when I'm thinking about it or it will be gone forever. <laughs> um, what else? Just in this new year, we're really excited about all the commissioners that are on board. Um, I appreciate, we all appreciate your participation. And I really feel like with where we're going this year and having all these new commissioners come on and everybody really seems to have pockets of really great knowledge that we can rely on. And you're sitting on these other committees and bring back that information. I think that's the best way to get stuff done is for us to know what's going on in these other committees, these other <clears throat> advocacy groups you bring special knowledge from your own counties and I'm such a doer and that's what I appreciate. I, I know that the commissioners that are on here and the commissioners that are setting to come forth are really like they like to see action taken. So we just really count this 2022 is participation from every commissioner um, and I have commissioners that have told me that they are interested in advocacy and membership. And so we'll just appoint those next month, but I appreciate those commissioners um, stepping up. Um, and we, I'm also gonna reach out to um, one of the commissioners who expressed that they want a, a bigger role. I'm gonna ask them about representing us on the rack. And I know we have Jen Nimmo and that's amazing if we can't get representation because she can be kind of like fill us in. But um, that's really 
all I had to report out on. And so um, now we'll go to discussion items. I was on, I mean, both myself and May Lane were on the PPACG board meeting. Um, one of the things that I heard them talk about, that's why I brought that up, is this call system. They wanted a little bit more information about could that be plausible for our areas. So I think we want to keep our eye on that. Um, well, listen, Link, if, I could, if I could else? interrupt here, I've got a, uh, oh, go I've got to get back up to Tri Lakes area here in about within the next 45 minutes. So if we can move ahead to the, the item that I had. That oh yeah, we don't, I don't really have anything else from the PPACG board. That's what I heard that they wanted to okay. work on. So you're up. Okay, great. Give me a second to bring up Dave's um, piece. Sure. Yeah. Everybody, Dave um, is gonna had, we had been discussing like, there's so many issues that are thrown at us and people wanna present and talk to us, but how do we hone down and make it more a structured process? So the two hours we have together a month makes sense and we make most of them. So this is what Dave is proposing. So Dave, take it away. Okay, great. So this is, this is uh, you can, the, the words are on the slide there. Let me just kind of give the big picture then. So basically as a commission, even though it's existed at the metropolitan area, I mean, now it's countywide. So they're in the senior areas we all know, or aging area, there are issues and there are actions. That's basically the two things. We have to figure out, okay, what are we gonna focus on? And then what are we gonna do? What are the actions that we come up with? Today's meeting, and this, this is what this presentation is focused on, is just the, uh, coming up with a working methodology that we can kind of figure out, okay, so this is probably good enough or it's a, it's a workable way to do a rack and stack on the various issues. Uh, in the future sometime, then we look at a similar, uh, you know, sort of a deep dive on what do we do for actions from this commission? How do we affect, how do we have an impact on somebody else? So basically it's a how-to for how choosing and prioritizing issues. Uh, why is it needed? We've got to have an impact. And in order to have that impact, it really is we've got to have some sort of process and structure, and we have to be able to track and measure whatever it is we're doing. If we're just taking somebody else's uh, recommendations or priorities or something else and, and passing them along, that's not really an impact. I think we're all of that mind that if we're involved in an organization like this commission, we want to have value added. So that's really why I think that methodology is really important. So I, I threw together this, so this next piece of three big issues, and that was just my cut at what I was thinking, and, and that was my mindset. And there's no priority in, in, in this. It's just saying that these are three that are really mega issues, if you will, or at that, at that very large level. And you can roll up uh, just about anything under the various trans, uh, issues. We heard about transport, transportation here, the transit report, housing, same thing. You can look at it from many different perspectives. And there are a lot of different elements to it, but the idea is that the, the focus probably on an annual basis or maybe persistent would be three mega issues. And then uh, other things would be rolled up in that. And there's a cross cutting piece for those three pieces. I think that's the other key thought is that you have the macro issues and then they're in a you know, vertical or one, two, three, whatever it is. And cross cutting all of that, it's really access, whether it's access to services, or technology or information, education, information, that type of thing. So that was a kind of the big macro view that, I, that Dave had at that point. The second slide then talks a little bit now, how do we do this, okay? So I kind of try to figure out, well, how do we do that? You know, we had an example last uh, last meeting, I guess it, somebody had the brought up the issue of Safeway in a particular area and it was a food desert, whatever it was. Okay, in my, in my little mind then, I was thinking, okay, that's an interest item for a commission. A commission is, a, is at a high level. So I, I kind of looked at the methodology as interest and concern and priority. Priority would be the highest thing. The concern would be something, uh, you know, those are the three bins. And interest then would be something that comes up from a member, either in neighborhoods or in conversations, participation in other groups, that type of thing. And the commission then would acknowledge that issue in the sense that we talk about it. We uh, and, and you know, maybe you have some referrals or something like that. But the idea then would be that the member, whoever brought that issue up, obviously it was important to that person or that member, they would be the one then that would continue to watch and monitor that issue and bring things up to the commission. 
the next highest level then would be a concern. This would be a number of members getting together or realizing that, yeah, there's a common understanding here that there's there's something that really needs to be done here. That's a, and, and from that perspective, you'd have the uh, commission then would accept this group. Two or three members would say, okay, yeah, I think exit this, this particular issue is significant enough that uh, the commission really should, has a role to play in this thing. That's where the commission then somehow would accept uh, that 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 uh, concern, if you will, and the group then, the two or three members that whoever raised it would be then responsible for developing responses and actions or potential sponsor uh, actions. So that's kind of it. Starting at the lower level, it would roll up to the concern, and the highest one would be the priority. This is really where the commission is endorsing, would endorse. Uh, and it would adopt that as, as one of their priorities. It could be in the macro area. But again, there would be a team then that would be assigned responsibility for developing the draft output, products, recommendations, position papers, briefings, whatever it may be. So that's kind of the hierarchy that I saw. So at the bottom of this slide here before you is kind of a real quick uh, uh, layout of how that might look. And, and there's no pride of authorship. I'm just trying to throw it out there. I think it's really important that each member take a look at that and say, oh, that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Uh, we need to look at it differently. So I look at the interest. You can see it down in the lower left-hand corner there in the far left column. It's local neighborhood. That's an individual level thing. And then you listen, advise, revert in the organizational role. And on the far right, there's a member update. If you look at the concern then, it would be more rural, urban, a little bit higher. It's an internal commission members are really concerned about this. And it's shared amongst the members. And then we discuss, review, and we study it or monitor it. And on the far right, we could come up with some actions or possible outfits over there. The highest level then, this would probably be only one or two things, maybe three things a year, where we actually uh, officially are trying to influence and affect somebody outside of the organization outside of the commission, above us, above the, in, in the food chain. Uh, we accept and endorse this particular as a priority. Uh, we could, a uh, number of different roles, would be a direct uh, sponsor, we could convene conferences, we could do collaboration or partnering to affect change, and then the outputs are on the far right. So that's my quick, quick and dirty uh, rundown on it. If you think about that Safeway issue that I mentioned as a food desert, somebody had brought that up at a previous meeting. Okay, that would be in my, in this, in this methodology construct, would be that's probably an interest. Okay, in order to get it to a, a concern level, that's probably where we're saying, by golly, that's really a common issue across multiple food, food stores, food chains in this region. Uh, and then the, at the concern level, we'd have certain things we might consider doing. And then if it were a real priority, then the priority might be food access across both rural and urban areas. So that's just kind of a quick and dirty rundown on, on Dave's thinking on how we need to tackle issues and come up with priorities. Feedback. So Dave, I thank you for your interest and in breaking it down. Um, I too agree that anything in any one of our three counties we serve we could have public presentations and public comments on everything every single month. But I love how we're going from our top three strategies. And what I foresee for 2022 is having at least our presentations make sense within the three things that we're trying to, the three areas that we're really, because that's how we get educated and that's how we decide you know, we get more educated on the advocacy piece of how we're going to move forward. Um, although we have representation from last year, now in all three counties, this is the year that I really want to see the things that we're advocating on, <coughs> see some change, see us on local and statewide initiatives and aligning all those goals because there's a lot, even under those three big headings, there's so much underneath that, that we have to keep focused, especially on the top three. And I agree that some things should be our concern and some things should be our interest. That all makes sense to me. And there has to be some kind of a prioritization. And I also think what you brought up about 
us measuring. And when we met with Dayton Romero, he kind of brought that up to us too. How do you guys measure? How do you know, you know, what you guys have been doing for the last year? How do you measure a month, three months, six months, the year? So I appreciate that as well. Um, that's just my feedback, <laughs> other commissioners. Well, since we really can't see, since this is uh, up on the screen and we really don't see the whole document in its whole, for me, it's really hard to understand all of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely needed and thank you, Dave, for putting it through, but it's really hard for me to have much of a comment without kind of looking at the whole thing on myself. Is there a way we can get this to us as individuals through email or something so we can actually review it yeah. and and understand it a little bit more fully than um, I, I know, Dave, you're, you're trying to do it this in a quick setting and it probably needs a whole lot more thought on every one of our parts. And I'll be happy to email that out today. Thanks. One thing that I want to add is that I appreciate that we're working within buckets, but I also appreciate the fact that our buckets are quite broad. For example, um, Melissa, do you want to just um, scroll up a, a little bit? When we talk about, um, to the, the top page, when we say um, healthcare, housing, transportation, those are huge buckets that have crosshairs, right? And I really like the methodology of Kimberly Crenshaw when she talks about intersectionality, which is basically saying that there's going to be multiple issues that interface on healthcare, right? We have caregiver issues, we have um, aging in place issues. So I appreciate that we have buckets, but within those buckets are, you know, it's, it's a bucket to, you know, infinity. So I think that in theory, we're trying to be focused, but I think that we will surprise ourselves at the crosshairs that might come out of these opportunities as well. So that's the first comment. The other thing is, is when we are talking about our measurement, um, I think that, it is a civic capital RS raising awareness on these issues. That was arguably one of the reasons the commission was developed was to raise awareness on aging issues. So I think that us having that measurement of civic capital raising awareness on these issues is our guiding star. A really great measurement is a better aging civic index with National Civic League. They quantify the measurement. But I think that that is, um, you know, if, if you, you want to tally it or if you just want to keep in the back of mind of raising awareness, I think that that's um, two comments on my end. Thanks and for that. Also I'm like have to run for momentarily. Do we have to take a vote on anything before we I leave? We can't vote. Yeah, we're going to be discussing. Um, okay. Yep. So. All right. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dave, for doing all that. Paula, thoughts? No. And I think um, the bigger thing Dave was just trying to say is like somehow quantify like every issue that comes in front of us. Is it a priority? Is it a concern? Is it an issue? But we can't get so heavily involved in every single issue that really gets presented to us. Like how are we gonna, we just need some guiding like, hey, is that a priority for us right now? Is that a concern? Is that an interest? That, that kind of thing when we were discussing it. And um, Dave just really dives deep in this. And so I, I also agree with Debbie. Let's all just look over it. And then we can also come back to it next month and just see what we what our thoughts are and how we want to organize this. But I definitely agree that, that some kind of organization is warranted because anybody that comes in front of us, everything could be um, labeled a, a senior issue. And why we want to hear about them, um, we also need to keep on focus of where we're going. That's why I'm glad we have three issues that we picked. And I agree with Mayling that those buckets can be very broad. Mm -hmm. And um, within those buckets, we can do, use something like this to help prioritize. Um, we just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page with how we do that. Sure. Exactly. Well, I those totally buckets, 
those buckets can intertwine also. Yeah. And so right. I, I don't want to be so stifled that we we can't um, have open right. discussion. And because that's where some of the best ideas come from is, is being open to um, collaboration and, and new ideas and thinking outside the box. So this to me seems very regimented in a in a commission that that just ebbs and flows um, really nicely. Um, that's I guess I did have comments. Sorry. Yeah, but that's okay. And I think there's um, we can be both. We can be a little bit structured in how we look at issues. But I also think what everybody's expertise brings to this is a little bit of nugget of information that we didn't know. And until we discuss it in an open forum, we don't know. We're like, oh yeah, that does intersect. That makes sense. We really do want to support that. And I think that by being really mindful with some of our pre uh, presenters, like that was really excellent information today from Laura Cruz and from Melissa to bring that forward because that crosses all three counties. It's it's high on all of our minds. Like, how do we make this work? And I love the idea of us advocating for these deadhead miles because it makes sense, not just for transit, but for the medical providers, like she was saying, EMTs. And um, if we can somehow support that, we can affect change in our region. So I love that. So I really love that comment, Paula. We don't want to be so regimented that we are closed down to new ideas, new information, and then incorporating that new information into our thought process. So totally agree with that. And I always want there to be us all to have a voice. Everyone's so respectful and brings their own expertise. So that is so, so important. And so, yes, I, I totally concur on that. All, all, I can, all I can say is, Alyssa, the onus is on you, then I hate to say it, as the leader, <laughs> the facilitator, you're the one that basically would have to decide what we talk about and to cut people off or to allow the discussion. So those kinds of things will, you know, actually take root and be productive for us. So we'll, we'll back I, you. I, we'll back you on that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's a tough job. So thank so, you for yeah, the we, job. We've um, reached out and and asked Melissa that going forward, like public comments and presenters come to myself and Mei Ling because then we have, we can kind of decide like what public comments and what like who, is that a really a priority if we have three or four public comments, what's the priority? And where do we want to put them in and those kind of things. And so it's not just me making the decision. It's me talking with the vice chair and seeing like, you know, I'm not always the one making the decision. I'm saying to my vice chair, does that make sense? What do you think? And you know what I mean? And we have Melissa right there with us, helping us to decide like, does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And somebody else's opinion. Um, so that's, I, I totally agree, Debbie. I'd like to just take a minute and remind folks um, with time and everything that the top three um, have not been voted on yet. And so maybe take a few minutes and kind of reflect on, um, you know, Elisa shared at the beginning kind of the priorities of what people sent through the emails to her that she heard. Um, you know, Dave kind of threw the those things out there in the document that he presented, but it's not that these things are written in stone yet until next next month, when ideally, you know, there will be these three big buckets um, that get voted on and approved by the commission, you know, understanding that then there could be some stuff that comes up underneath them that's going to start to shake out over time too. But um, so maybe you guys might want to take a few minutes and really talk about having Lisa, you know, bring up again the things that you saw come out through that email. Uh, present those again right now and just have some time, um, the people who are on the call to just really dig into that for a few minutes in preparation for a potential vote in February. So, I, I'm going to say that I'm, I'm totally with what you said, Elisa, in terms of combining the third area of social isolation, behavioral health, mental health, because they are all ultimately the same thing. Um, so if, uh, if, 
everyone else, I mean, I'm just letting you know that I, I agree with that and um, I'll, I'll uh, actually support that. And I thought a lot more like I put kind of just throughout one idea I had to get us thinking like we know housing is at an all time shortage. What does affordable housing look like? And when people use that word affordable, it means something different, like mm -hmm. to two different demographics of people. So let's re, like think about affordable, but also during this year, do we want to investigate other things? Like we know we've talked about home share, silver nest, um, the sunshine, but the only reason I brought up that idea in the thing that I sent to you is because I have recently um, become, uh, I'm prepping to become a host home for a disabled person. And so I know from doing that, that would help with housing because I'm taking this other person in that would need housing, but let's substitute the disabled person for an aging person, right? So on the disabled, um, the income that I would take in as rent would be non-taxable. So would that be feasible if somebody was sharing their house with an aging person and that also became non-taxable, that would really be an incentive. Is that something that we could even ask if that could happen at a, a local or a state level? Because that would free up some housing it would help with that social isolation and social participation because you have like different generations in the same household, but maybe more people would wanna get involved if they knew it was non-taxable, just like maybe a disabled person would be to have in your household. So that was just one of the ideas I was thinking about, like what can we creatively think about like housing other than just a housing community? Like there has to be other ideas we can support. It all falls under housing to me, so right. I really do. So just, just new ideas because like we know, like a community is not gonna be feasible in Park County. There's a reason that people have chosen to live in rural areas and they're not going to a community. They want their privacy. They've moved away to more like live, you know, naturally and have a say-so in how they age. So that solutions that we're gonna be coming up with are going to have to take that into effect uh, into mind too. You know, I think there are host home situations for elderly. Um, I'm not sure if it's uh, well, under it's certain providers or not. Yeah, you, you're you're yeah. So if that we would could be incentivize a good... it to be non-taxable. Could well, we? Right. But could we get somebody to talk about it with us? Yeah, get some information so we can become experts. And quite honestly. We said it earlier, we, we need people on to do presentations to us so we can become better experts so we can accurately advocate. So right, right. I, I like the idea, but we just need an expert to be able to talk to us about it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted once, like I was saying, for March to have that lobbyist on. So once we kind of say, these are our three things, can you, even before the meeting, I would like to reach out to him and say, which bills have a chance of going through or being put forth that involve any of these three areas that we can read along with him before he mm -hmm. presents to us so that we have thought out questions that we're going to ask him while we have him. So if he sends yes. us the information before, then we can investigate and be like, hey, I want to talk about like article 216 or whatever it is. And then we can be like more well-versed while we have them here. Sounds reasonable to me. I mean, that's that's part of the work we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then as far as transportation, we have some transfer. Obviously, we had an expert on today. A bunch of you are going to sit on those subcommittees. That'll be great. Um, my next uh, foray will be into, um, I want to talk to Eric Gibbs from Peak View and tell him what our concerns are and see if he can give us a presentation on where we are in the mental health um, locally, regionally, what he knows is coming at a state level, that kind of thing, um, how they're getting paid. 
um, cause that's probably also a hindering block too. Um, I know just from telling you guys, I've had a lot of mental health issues with my teenage children and there are so many roadblocks in the state of Colorado. It's ridiculous to say that this is an area that is underfunded. So when, um, I had asked the, a local coroner, if there's anything we can do at a state level also to incentivize uh, mental health providers to come here kind of like they do with the PA and the nurse practitioners to rural areas, if we can incentivize it at a state level to maybe pay some of their college tuition or whatever, just to get them in the state of Colorado. Um, so I want to talk to Eric Gibbs about that if there's some of these, but I'm going to see if we can get a professional um, to come talk to us. And Melissa brought up an amazing point. We were talking um, about reaching out to these people. And I said, you know, the other provider for mental health is Diversus Health. And she told me there's just some internal, not good stuff going on. So I'm going to steer towards Eric Gibbs. I've worked with him in the past and just see what kind of experts he can throw at us. Um, so just to kind of um, highlight a little bit more about the Diversus situation, it's not just Diversus, it's statewide. Um, the organizations in the different regions around the state who were paid by the state to actually provide the behavioral health services in the communities and were contracted with the state to do it mm -hmm. um, have all been under investigation uh, for not providing services to, to people. And so there are executive directors around the state that are leaving their roles because their entity was not providing services. But yet for years, they've been under a contract with the state and nobody has called them into question in terms of their uh, services to people. Um, and so there've been multiple very in-depth uh, newspaper articles about the changes um, happening across the state, not just in our area, but across the state. And so, and this gets at the fact that Colorado is, you know, 54th in the nation and in, in terms of providing behavioral health services to people, you know, our state ha is getting turned on its head right now um, with behavioral health and it's about time. Mm -hmm. And, but it's, it'll be interesting to see how long the shakeout takes before we really start to see. I mean, I actually, I honestly feel like we're already doing some things better. Um, however, we have a long road ahead of us. So um, it's there. I don't know if any, anyone else, but when you are dealing with a relative, a loved one that's suicidal and they tell you they can get you on a wait list for three months from now, and you're saying to yourself, my child's not going to make it that long. They might not even make it through the weekend. So these are, and they're, you know, having been in a senior community, um, our, you know, the seniors were also experiencing that kind of weight because there's even fewer that spare, that have this specialty in gerontology to be able to talk to seniors about their issues and the cognitive that goes along with that. So there's even they're on a long wait time too. And something that I did not know that was news to me is besides the teenage population in the state of cop, uh, in the state of Colorado, the next highest suicide rate is aging adult males, elderly men. And I didn't know that until I got, went to this thing, um, about my children's teenage stuff and heard some demographics. And I was like, that, that was shocking to me. It makes sense when I think about it, but I just didn't know. And so, yeah, there's definitely um, some work we could be behind in all of these arenas. And so are, is there another bucket that is on people's minds besides these top three already, or because everybody spoke their mind through the email chains? it's looking like these are the, these are the top ones. I was going to say, if you need somebody to move to make them the top three, I am definitely willing to so move. Well, and we want, we'll, we'll vote on them next month, but I'm going to kind of capture it to put out Got there. It. And so what I have is housing, transportation, 
And then that third one is social isolation, behavioral health. Was there a third part to that? It kind of rolls into each other, social participation. Okay. And we feel like if you were mentally, I feel like they kind of complement each other in a sense. Like if you were mentally better, you maybe would go out and participate. And if you weren't so isolated, you would go out and participate. And then maybe you wouldn't be as depressed or anxious if there was these things. So I think if, if we could find some initiatives to support those things, um, that they kind of wouldn't be cyclical with each other. Um, Paula, just, just a different thing. Paula had brought up that the, the third week of February is what, Paula? The 16th, not the 24th is a Thursday. I didn't know if that meeting date was correct, but the third Wednesday in February is February 16th. So I didn't know if oh, that. Yeah. That the, yep. I have that wrong. So yeah. And it's the same for March. The March date is exactly the same. Thanks. Yep. And, you know, I, I understand it's my duty to appoint the members, the, you know, the committees, and I'll just put it out there now. So everybody knows who has asked me about roles. So, um, Paula, um, has volunteered to be the membership chair. I'm just telling you, so we can all think about, you know, where it's going to go next month. And, um, Mei Ling has, um, volunteered to be, um, the chair of advocacy and, um, talking to our incoming commissioners. Um, I understand that Dayton would have, would be a part of the, um, advocacy commission. He's so heavily knowledgeable in that. And I'm understanding that Lindsay would want to be a part of membership. Her being at the senior center um, just kind of makes sense and what her world is. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going for next month. So I just wanted to, I, I think they're all really great fits. And um, Leilani had expressed to me that she wants to take a bigger role. And I was going to reach out to her. And Melissa had made the suggestion that she might be a good representative for the RAC. Um, the only thing is, is she, I feel like sometimes she has a hard time getting onto the meeting. So I don't know being in a community with being understaffed, if she'll be able to commit to that on a regular meeting. Um, and then Mei Ling and I had discussed um, between the two of us, we are going to try and always participate in um, the PPACG board meetings. If I can't make it, um, I will reach out to Mei Ling and Mei Ling is going to um, continue to be a part of the CCA, the Colorado Center on Aging. Um, and I know some of our other commissioners sit in on that. I'm pretty sure Amy Mitchell does um, as well. So that's just kind of wanted to let you guys know what to expect for next month. And I, I think that Paula will be amazing. And I think Mei Ling will be amazing. And we're gonna ask all of the other commissioners to jump on and support one of those two committees. Anybody else have anything before we get ready to wrap it up? I, I think this was a great meeting. We haven't seen each other since November and really been able to talk. And I'm, I'm actually kind of energized about where we can go this year. We have a phenomenal team and more focus. And I just think we're going to do great things this year. I just, I feel it. I agree with you. So thank you everybody for the ongoing commitments and um, efforts to nail down kind of the topic and interest areas to really help guide what the meetings focus on and the action and having measurements and all kinds of um, good ideas for the year ahead. And we have so many supporting, we, I didn't get to, Teacher Wardley was on from uh, CSPD, um, and then we have Jen Nimmo from the RAC. We have all of these other supporting, you know, players that are feeding us information and collaborating. And I think you've all have said it before, collaboration is the key. We have so many counties and we're all overlapping. And so that we all are talking to each other is I think just what needs to, to happen. 
So thank you again, everyone. If no one has anything else, we will call this meeting to adjournment. Mei Ling, I'll see you Monday. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Good night, everybody. We'll see you all next month. All right. Thanks, Debbie. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Paula. Bye, Melissa.